Hi, and welcome back to part two of the Storytellers Workshop. This week, we are going to be looking at uh, the, the various barriers that people face when they come to Christ. I'm going to have you guys do a, uh, a, a roundtable discussion out there in your groups and here together. But before we do that, I want to do a quick recap of what we did last week. Last week, we looked at people's life as a story and saw that their story is kind of a series of steps moving from far from God, going their own way, and taking step by step through many decisions to the point where they actually give their life to Christ. Okay, and we saw that, that as they take th these steps, um, there's various barriers along the way that keeps them. And we saw that, that there's kind of three main sections to it. Okay, and this week we're going to focus more on this section, next week we're going to look at this section, and then the third week, or the fourth week, we're going to look at this section. But we also talked about how you are a character in their story, and so you play a role at each one of these steps along the way. What I want us to do right now before we dive into the content is I want us to, in our groups and right here, talk about together uh, what are the barriers, what are the particular barriers that get in the way of people moving forward in, in coming to faith in Christ. Specifically, why do you think so many people in our culture either don't seem very interested in Christianity or they're more or less resistant to it? So there's two big categories there. On the one hand, I think you find with your friends that they're either just apathetic, they just don't really care, you, you don't even seem to get the conversation going because they just don't want to talk about it, or if it does come up, you get this pushback, you get resistance. It's one or the other or both, okay? What I want you to think about is why? And not just the spiritual answer, though there are spiritual answers. I'm not saying don't name those, but also think about the cultural answers. What is it about our culture that causes people to either not care, not be interested, or push back or be resistant against Christianity and the gospel, okay? So let's take a moment, talk about that, and then I'll pull us back together.
Okay, let's, let's pull it back together. Um, very good. Listen, uh, like I said, um, we're going to be looking at these, these objections, the things that you guys just talked about are, are things that stop people from moving forward and they're going to fall into two different categories. We're going to look at one category of them. Before we do, I want to talk a little bit about fortresses, okay? About the fact that people put up these barriers, people have these walls up against, um, against lots of things, not just Christianity, okay? One of my favorite childhood memories, when I was a little kid, I was about eight, nine years old, my friend and I uh, found this old junkyard it had this building that was all locked off. We couldn't get into that, but there was this old uh, school bus out there, another old beat-up car, a bunch of appliances and machinery. But the best part in the back was this pile of, of, of wooden crates. There were like these wooden fruit boxes, pallets. There were these stacks of pallets that had a gap between them. And what we did was we started taking all these boxes and just piling them up. We made a huge mound but we left the space between the pallets. It created like a little room. It had a roof over it, it had walls. But, but when we piled it up, we created a little tunnel. So there's this tunnel under these boxes, and you had to know which little box. You opened the little box and it led into your little tunnel, and you wound your way in to this little secret room inside. So this is how we built this fort. So we used to pretend stuff and play in our little fort, and then one day it got tested in real life. We looked out across the field, and we saw the scariest thing that two little eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds could see, and that was teenage boys coming our way. And so we, we scurried into our little, you know, opened up our little door, ran, crawled through our little tunnel, pulled the little door closed behind us, sat in there quietly, and these boys came, and, and they're climbing around on top of our big pile of, of uh, boxes, and we could see them through the cracks and hear them talking, and we're in there like nervous but quiet, and they messed around for I forget how long it was, and eventually they went on their way. And I'll just never forget the great feeling that was to be in our little safe, little fortress, and it worked. You know, it held. Um, it was a wonderful feeling. And, and the question, you know, keep that in your mind when you just think about people and their fortresses. Uh, why do people build fortresses? They build fortresses because it's a scary world out there. Um, they're protecting something. They're protecting something deep inside. Personally, we build fortresses because we're protecting our hearts something very deep. But what I want you to think about too is that there are layers of defense. Okay, there are layers of defense. And uh, ancient cities had these, these fortresses, these, uh, these same structures. There's a great verse in Proverbs that says, a wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. And we're going to talk about being wise and getting past these barriers. But it talks about the city wall or the outside of the city and then getting to the stronghold. Uh, and what I want you to think about is, and this is like medieval towns, or, or but think of the ancient towns actually is a little different. You used to have a wall. Think about Jericho, right? You had Jericho, it had the wall around it. And you've got basically three layers of defense that, that people um, have or, or cities had. The outside, the wall is what we call a passive outer layer. It's passive because it just sits there. The wall just there. The wall doesn't attack anybody. It's just there, standing there, keeps out the bad stuff. People inside might not even be aware there is something out there. Okay? That's where we're going to focus today. If an enemy comes and breaches the wall, then the inner uh, defense, which is an active defense, kicks in. The soldiers attack whoever's trying to get through the wall. If that fails, then they run to their keep or their stronghold. It's kind of the last line of defense. And for people, that's their heart. Okay? These three layers roughly correspond to our three sort of sections of people coming to Christ. This is the outer layer, um, sort of that passive. Think about it now. They're not, even, they're not even aware. They're not even thinking about God back here, if you remember. God's not even on their radar. It's as if He's just outside the wall. And they're just going about their business, and who cares what's going on outside the wall? Okay? Not even on their radar. Something happens, like they get to this part here, um, that's kind of a breach in the wall. Become aware of a need or there's a void in your life. A couple of you mentioned that. Um, and, and all of a sudden now, uh, truth or thoughts, ideas start coming in, and now they begin that struggle. But that's when you start hearing those objections that some of you were saying. You know, 
well, you know, Christians are intolerant or this or that, or I got hurt in the church or, you know, something bad happened in my life regarding Christianity. And that's more conscious. These are more their conscious defenses, the things they actually say and think that push back against God and against Christianity, okay? But what I want you to keep in mind is that these are two layers of defense, but they're guarding the stronghold. A lot of times we make a mistake, and we're going to get more into this in the coming weeks, that we have to deal with this, these, these attacks or these objections, but keep in mind that they're not really the ultimate defense. That's really not the real issue. They're usually uh, guarding something deeper. They point to the deeper. We're, I'm going to teach you how to take what they say here and try to discern what's really going on deep in their heart. Um, but they're still like an outer defense. All right. Give you an illustration of of how that works. Uh, one example would be Jesus with the uh, the rich young ruler. So the rich young ruler, he he kind of blew through this part. He came positively to Jesus. Hey, tell me how to get eternal life. Good teacher, you know. So he had a positive attitude towards the messenger, uh, open to him. But he was playing games, right? He was, you know, sorry. Oh, I keep the law. Jesus pressed him a little, and that caused a little bit of conflict here. And then what did Jesus do? He went right for the stronghold. He said, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. And the guy went away sad because he had great possessions. Jesus got the guy to face his stronghold. And in this case, the guy walked away. At that point, he didn't choose to follow. An example in my own life, one time I, uh, I had a friend, um, it's when we were... In Ireland, my wife and I were in Ireland as missionaries uh, to college students, and um, my uh, we met this this student, and she had gotten to the point of really enjoyed us. She was a seeker, saw a difference in us. We were actually having these spiritual conversations, and then she she had a lot of friends, so she had an atheist friend and said, "Hey, you got to meet this, you know, these Americans, you know, <laughs> and uh, come, you know, because this guy was an atheist, and this guy said." It's irrational to believe in God. He just thought it was just for fools and it was just irrational. She said, well, you got to meet my friend Dave. So she set it up. And, and by the way, that, that points out a little side thing here. So we had established a relationship with her. These relationships can carry over. So she sets up a meeting with a guy I've never met. And we get to hop right from not knowing him to a spiritual conversation. Why? Because she trusted me and he trusted her. <laughs> So there's sort of a transitive effect there, and now here we are having a conversation. So that's how it can work with your friends as well. So we sit down, and the guy says, yeah, I think it's irrational to believe in God. And I said, you know, I bet you before the night is done that you'll at least admit that it's at least rational to believe in God, if not more rational to believe than not to believe. But at the very least, I think before the evening's over, you're going to say that it's not irrational. It's a rational thing to believe in God. Yeah, okay. So we get going and go through a bunch of stuff. And sure enough, by the end of the evening, he, he said, he very honestly said, yep, you know, I, I see that it not only is it rational to believe in God, but it's actually, he, he actually said, I, I was a little ambitious there. I didn't know if I could actually get him to that point. But he actually said it was more rational to believe in God than not. And I said, well, what are you going to do with that now? He said, well, I'm young. And I still want to have a lot of fun, and I know what I ought to do is maybe look into this some more, but I just want to have a good time. I really don't want to spend time on this. I want to go do what I want to do. And I said, well, okay, I appreciate your honesty. I said, number one, don't use that rational or irrational excuse anymore, <laughs> but thank you for being honest. And what happened there is, again, we got past this one quick. We got into this. But what happened was these defenses got neutralized, and now he was face to face with his stronghold. He just wants to live his own life. And that's good. Like, it's good that he saw that. I don't know whatever happened to him after that, but that's progress. Even if he didn't choose to do the next best thing, you know, the right thing, it was still a, a, a good progression um, in trying to help him find Christ. So, those are just some examples of how that works. Um, Again, next week we're going to look at dealing with those more active defenses. Uh, what I want to do right now, though, is sort of focus in on the wall. Okay, so pretend you're walking up to the wall. And so here's a person, and you go up to their wall. Now we're going to kind of get the real close-up view of the bricks in the wall. Uh, when I asked you to think about barriers, thinking of the passive, the I don't care, apathetic barriers, this is what we're going to look at. And, 
And some of you even talked about this in your groups here and, and at home. I'm sure you're going to recognize some of these things that came up. So let's talk about these. Uh, one of them would be, somebody mentioned this, busyness. So busyness is a huge one. People are just frantically... So one reason they don't even give God the time of day is because they just... This is the person that just says, I don't have time for that. Like, I'm run, taking my kids to this and that and soccer practice and got a job and got this and got that. Too busy to do it. Just, God doesn't fit. There's no space in their life to have deep thoughts and reflect on deep things, okay, including God. So that would be one. A second one is that they're overwhelmed with choices. They're overwhelmed with choices. It's something we kind of take for granted or, or sort of the water we swim in as Westerners. But this wasn't always true. If you think, you know, 500 years, 1,000 years, or in other cultures, they don't have all the choices that we have. And when you have an overwhelming bunch of choices, and I'm talking about everything from the dog food you're going to buy to all the way up to what God you're going to believe in, when you're overwhelmed with choices, people tend to just go, they just shut down. They just step away. They don't even want to engage it. It freezes them up. And when they're dealing with all these choices on the ground, let alone these big choices about you know, spiritual things, they just want to keep it at, at arm's length. Um, we call this, by the way, the, the buffered self. This, this wall is like a buffer. It's a way that people buffer themselves against all the stuff that's coming at them from the outside. Okay? And so here we have this buffer of all these choices. It's like, well, just keep it away from me. There's so many choices, I don't even know where to start. So that's that one. A third one is uncertainty. This is related to that one. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, factors or the characteristics of Western culture is partly it's a glorification of uncertainty. Uh, the culture doesn't like certainty. When you come in saying you're so sure, they're suspicious immediately. And it's not just because they're a bunch of relativists that just want to do their own thing. Part of the reason why they're that way, there's actually humility to it. That they, they're going, there's so much out there. How, how do you, what did you do? Get a PhD in, in religion or something? How are you so sure? They're so, they're, again, in the past, you grew up in a culture you only were presented with one option. <laughs> you were either going to believe it or not. Um, and maybe there's two options because a missionary showed up and gave you a second option. In our culture, there's millions of options, and so people just kind of look at them all and go, well, I, I don't know, and who am I to say that one's right and all the rest are wrong? Okay, so they're uncertain. Uh, and then the final one is distractions, distractions. Uh, this is just the fact that uh, because we're overwhelmed, because it's so difficult out there, one of the ways we buffer ourselves against all this is it's a lot easier to just watch cat videos on YouTube, right? <laughs> um, we escape. We escape. Life is overwhelming, overwhelming, uh, overwhelming, overwhelming. And so we escape into our entertainments. And that just crowds out whatever remaining space there was to think about deep things. It gets pushed out because it's a whole lot easier to just be entertained than to think and talk about this hard stuff, okay? So these are, but notice that these are passive. People don't wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to get busy, get distracted, be overwhelmed, so I don't have to deal with God. They don't do that. It just kind of happens to them. All right? So the question is, what does God do? What, does, what are the things that God does or uses to get past this outer passive defense? And another way of asking that question is, how does God rise above the noise? Because really that's what this is. It's a bunch of noise. The culture is filled with noise. And when you come with your Christian t-shirt on, well, they just think there's another t-shirt. Or your bumper sticker, well, that's just another bumper sticker. Or we throw something on the internet and go, this is so cool. And they go, well, that's just another thing on the internet. These are people who one minute are hitting like to some deep cause like human trafficking, and then two minutes later are watching a cat video, you know? And we just alternate between these. And the point is this. They don't deeply engage in any of it. They, they just sample and touch. They don't deeply engage. That wall keeps things buffered out there, keeps them far away, keeps God far away. How does God get himself on the radar with people in that cultural setting? Well, let me uh, tell you a few ways. 
First of all, he breaks through by his Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's just, yeah, and this is on page, uh, page 9 in your workbook, 9 and 10. So he breaks through by uh, the Holy Spirit just stirs something in their heart, okay? Just out of nowhere or whatever, can't explain it, Spirit just moves. But God, by His Spirit, also uses other things to get their attention. Another one is circumstances. Circumstances that get their attention. Something bad happens in their life, basically breaches the wall. You know, a loss, a loss of a job, a loss of a loved one, an illness, a serious illness. It causes people to stop and go and reflect and think about, well, what is their life? Sometimes it's a positive circumstance. I've had many people say it was like the birth of a child. They, they just go, wow, that just the wonder of it makes them think about bigger things. Or, and then they're thinking, I've got to raise this child. So they start thinking about bigger things. And so, so sometimes it's positive circumstances. But God will use circumstances to get people to start considering and stopping to think about important stuff. But the third thing God uses, and this is where we come in, is He uses relationships. He uses relationships. Basically, the way God uses relationships, this is a little section of the wall here, right? Just uh, All that stuff's, you know, to them, God and everything, it, the noise, it's just part of the noise. Us and a lot of our efforts is just part of the noise. We advertise another event. They see our billboard. They pass it. Well, that's one of 50 billboards they saw. It's just noise, right, to, to a lot of them. In relationship, what happens is there's a, little, there's a little gate in the city wall, and when a relationship is built, what do they do? They just open their little door because it's you, and you walk right through. And once you're on the inside, it's a whole different story. Because people tend to pay attention when their friends have an idea. When their friend is talking about something, or their friend is going through something, or their friend is this, or their friend is that, that tends to rise above the noise. So your ideas, um, even your t-shirt <laughs> that has some message on it, they actually might discuss it with you if they know you. Um, it might actually get on the radar. So relationships are key to getting past this first barrier which is why you need to get past them being aware of you. Once they get a positive attitude towards you, see a difference in you, this is you building a relationship to the point where they're letting you on the inside. Maybe not all the way in, but at least past that outer defense. Okay? Now, uh, this requires cl close contact. And so what this is, and what the main point of today's uh, workshop is, is the importance of building bridges of trust. So when we talk about relationship, we're really talking about trust. Um, and what we're, what we're saying here is that uh, this part, it kind of fits with this, this first part, you're building a bridge. And you're building a bridge for what? Why do you build bridges? Well, you're building a bridge to carry cargo. You're building a bridge to carry a cargo of truth. And the thing is, the gospel, I sometimes think we forget this when we sort of reduce the gospel down to a simple presentation or, or maybe we even take our own salvation for granted. It's a pretty heavy cargo. We're talking about the, the stronghold of people's hearts. We're talking about them turning away from you know, themselves or an idol or whatever and giving themselves to God. That's, that's heavy stuff. And it really needs a strong bridge to carry it. Okay? And so... We want to be building a relationship of trust, which is really building a bridge to carry truth. And there's a direct correlation between the strength of your bridge and the amount of truth it can carry. So we want to build strong bridges like this, okay, that carry big trucks like that, because that's the gospel's heavy stuff, right? We don't want to have bridges like this, <laughs> um, you know, that are a little prohibitive, you know, um, and mainly that. You can't really drive a truck across that bridge. And what we find is that we bring, if you go back to the, the main, um, you know, to our, when we start bringing like heavy cargo back here and the bridge is weak, that's when we, we find that they're looking at us like, I'm not ready for that. Or that's per, you, you're getting really personal and intense here. We did not got much of a bridge here, so sorry, you know. That's, too, that's risky. This is a weak bridge. This thing's going to cave in and they don't, want to, they don't want to go there. So we want our bridges to be strong. So, given that that's the case, um, we're going to do a little exercise. And one thing I want you to be thinking about 
at least at this stage, if you're building a relationship with somebody, as, as Christians, we tend to think all content, that the gospel is all about getting, getting those words to them, right? Talking to them. And what we really need to keep in mind is that the relational part is, is what sets us up to be able to bring that content. And so when you've had an encounter with someone, you know, you've been with a friend or a relative, rather than asking yourself, well, did I get the words out? You know, you, we hear of opportunities, right? Oh, there's an opportunity there. They brought up something. And I didn't talk about Jesus. You know, I didn't bring some content. Instead of always thinking content, ask yourself afterward, how did they um, experience me after that? This is back to our storyteller thing. Remember, you're a character in the story. You're not just the paper boy, you know, throwing newspapers into their yard. You're a character in their story. How did they experience me? And here's another question to ask. Was trust built? Did trust increase as a result of that encounter? Because as the trust goes up, the ability to share more truth back and forth goes up. All right? So what I want you to do, um, this, let's get real practical. That's kind of the ideas level of it all. Let's get really practical now in our groups. Uh, you got a little exercise on page, I think it's page 10. Yep. This is a reflection, so this is just do by yourself. What I want you to do is ask yourself, how well do I know my friends? Now, focus on friends here, family. You probably know a lot about your family. Family dynamics are a little different. The, the difficulties there are in a different category. Think about friends you have or acquaintances. Pick one or two or three of the ones you have on your list. Start with one friend. And on page 10, just start, start going through and uh, giving yourself points. And down at the bottom, you can see how well you scored. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of minutes to score yourself on how well do you know your friends.
Okay, let's uh, pull back together. Again, I want to say this is not a scientific uh, assessment. Um, this is just supposed to get you in the ballpark, get you thinking. In fact, some of those questions might just give you ideas of questions you can ask, ways you can get to know somebody. And really, some of those have to do with the beginning stages of a relationship, but they, they just point to, they hopefully get you reflecting on, you know, gee, how deeply do I know this person and is there room to grow the relationship? And so actually what I want you to do is turn around now and actually have a discussion among, our, among yourselves and your group um, and talk about practical ways to grow a relationship, okay? What are some things you can do to, because a lot of times our relationships stagnate, especially with people, you know, who, who are far from God that we just kind of know. They sort of level off and, then, and, and it's just not going anywhere. So, so talk in your, in your groups about um, ways to further a relationship, real practical things you can do that would get that relationship moving and deepening, okay? So take about four minutes and talk about that and we'll get back together.
Okay, let's pull it back together. Heard some great things here. Hope you guys out there came up with some stuff. Let's compare some notes here. Uh, talk about some things. One of, the, one of the good ones I heard here uh, was this idea of, of not relying on social media to be your only source of knowing the person. And the reason why, the point that was made, is a really good point made, is that they don't know that you know. You know, it's not, they didn't tell you directly. And so there's something about the connection that's made when they've actually literally shared it with you, whatever the detail about their life is. You might think, oh, I know this person. Yeah, these days, you can stalk them on Facebook and get all those answers, you know, in your workbook. But that doesn't mean, and, and we're going to look at that. There's an important principle here. There's a two, the bridge, the cargo bridge is, needs to have traffic going both ways. And it's not that you're just collecting information, however you can get it. We're not the NSA, you know. Um, it's, it's that they're, they're disclosing, and they're disclosing it to you. Huge thing. That was a, that was a great point. Uh, another person said, ask good questions. So one way to build relationship is to ask good questions. And we're going to talk more about that next week, the importance of questions. Uh, but that's a huge one, being able to ask really good questions. Uh, and there were some other things said, but I have a few myself. Um, and that's what we did. So one, this was mentioned as well, spending time together, just literally spending time together. You got to make the time. We're busy people, but you can't build a relationship without time. There's just no substitute for time. So finding ways to get together, um, eating together, so meals, getting together, great way. People, there's something about sharing a meal, um, you know, going out to coffee, that sort of thing that people connect and bond over that. Conversations happen. Real simple things, serve them, you know, do something to serve them. But, you know, this has come up a few times in some of our discussion here, maybe in your groups at home. Uh, even more powerful than that is to let them serve you, uh, to let them serve you. Jesus did this when he sat down by the well. He asked the woman at the well for a drink of water. And that kicked off a conversation. That got something going. It made her curious. Why are you asking me, you know? And Jesus borrowed a boat once so he could preach to the crowds on the side. Jesus, the point of that is you might think asking them to serve you, that seems like I'm putting them in a servant and me up here. No, it's showing vulnerability. It's saying, it's putting you down on their level and saying, I'm no better than you. I have needs. I need your help. And when you're, when you're vulnerable with people and say, I could use your help, they, it builds trust. It, it makes them feel significant in your life. It, it creates a bond. Um, I talked to you guys last week about my neighbors, you know, my various neighbors. Well, the neighbor that had us over to the Christmas party, you know, we had some decent conversations, nothing too deep, you know, just trying to get that relationship going. But the other day um, I asked him, we, we have an event we're going to be doing here at the church, and he has a unique skill set. Uh, it's his profession that he could actually help us. And I asked him, hey, would you be willing to help us out with this? And he was, he, he, I'd love to, he said. Uh, wants to come help out, and he and he went on to say, "His last time I was at that church, he said, I was a teenager. It was a lock-in, you know, for teenagers." He goes, "It's about time I got back there." And that was a significant comment coming out of me asking him if he could help us. So ask them to serve you. So there's things like this are all ways that we can get the relationship built. I wanted to say something uh, really quick. This kind of came up a little bit. This is something that's gonna. It's later in your workbook, but I wanted to bring it up now because it, it, it looks different all along the way, but it's what I call the mirror effect. And it's simply the fact that people, human beings, tend to mirror back the way, what we are to them. You know, if I say, hi, Larissa, you know, your tendency is to just stare at me. No, it's to say, hi, Dave, you know, back. Most people, when you say hi, they say hi back. Uh, if, they, if you smile at them, they smile back. If you ask, how are your kids, they, you know, not, now some people are losing this ability, <laughs> but, um, you know, they'll ask back, well, how, and how are your kids doing? Uh, you invite them over for dinner, they'll invite you over for dinner. That's how relationships build. Um, we, we tend to mirror back and forth. So it's kind of the golden rule played out, you know, do, do to others you would have them do to you. I mean, you should just, that's just a way to know what to do, but when you do to others, as you would have them do to you, they kind of come back and do it back. Um, and the relationship forms based on that. Uh, so for now, we'll talk about that as it relates to conversation later. 
but it also relates to just the, re the relationship building process. People will mirror back what you do. Okay, what I want to talk about now is, um, at, the at the end here as we wrap, is and somebody mentioned uh, asking questions. Um, and we're going to talk more about asking questions next week. But I want to talk about this one particular aspect of relationship building that is crucial, and that is listening. It's an area that I, it's a human problem that we don't listen well. I think it's a Western American problem. As we know in our culture, people are just shouting at each other and not listening very well. And I think it's often a Christian problem because, again, we're told to go out and talk. Go tell people about Jesus. And yet we have to remember that listening is a part of the telling. Like there needs to be a two-way conversation. We have our verse we looked at last time, be ready to give, be prepared to give an answer to anybody who asks you about the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. I want you to keep that verse in mind, but also pair that with this great verse in Proverbs that says to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. So before we answer people's questions or objections or whatever it is, we need to make sure we've really done the hard work of listening. Of course, what do we mean by, by listening? Um, I'll give you an example of not listening, um, and there's many of them. I mean, we've all done it, and we've all experienced it. And by the way, everything I say about listening here, if you're married, this is all free marriage advice too, okay? <laughs> so important stuff is listening. Uh, one time when I was a student, actually, living in the dorms, I uh, went to our college event, you know, I was a believer, and, and I and invited my a dorm mate, somebody that lived in my building, a friend of mine, to come to this event. It was an outreach event of our college group, and he, we'd go, and, and you know, he, he enjoyed it. It was good. Well, that week, uh, one of the staff people from our church, the college staff people, went and visited him. They'd go around and visit the visitors, you know, the new people. And uh, so he got a visit in the dorms. Well, I got, a phone, I got two phone calls within... 10 minutes of each other. The first was from that staff person. He calls him and says, Dave, guess what? I visited your friend Scott, and we talked, and I shared the gospel with him, and he prayed to receive Christ. Isn't that awesome? And I'm like, whoa, that's great. Of course, I know the guy, and I'm thinking, wow. I mean, I'm having doubts because I know him. You know how it is when you know the person. I'm, but I'm going, oh, I'm beating myself up thinking, yeah, I should have more faith. He came to Jesus. That's great. You know, I'm excited that, that this happened. So we have this conversation, hang up the phone, Ten minutes later, I get a call from my friend Scott, and he goes, Dave, you got to help me. <laughs> this guy came to my door, and he like showed me this little book, and he did this, and he did that, and the only way I could get rid of him was to pray with him. <laughs> the good news is he still trusted me. <laughs> it's enough to come to me. But the bad news is, obviously, that person made a lot of mistakes. The biggest one being is he didn't take time to listen. He didn't take time to really find out where this guy was at. He probably just talked the whole time and didn't listen. Listening, uh, a, a great, uh, uh, it's not really a definition, but I like Cloud and Townsend, um, uh, Henry Cloud, John Townsend say this. They say, you know uh, that you have truly listened when you not only get what the other person is saying, but when they get that you get it. Okay, you hear that? It's not just that you think you got it, whatever they were saying. It's that that person gets that you get it. Ultimately, they are the judge as to whether you listen, not you. You might walk away thinking, you know, oh, I listened really well. The real question is, do they think that you listen? Now, a lot of us get uncomfortable with that because we think, because listening means not only do I know what you're saying, I know why you're saying it. I get you. I get why you hold that position. And we get uncomfortable because we think that if we show that level of understanding that somehow we're agreeing with them, that we're compromising. But, but getting someone or listening to them doesn't mean you're agreeing with them. It just means, in fact, the best thing a person can say about you if you're talking about something you disagree on, the best thing they can say is, wow, we don't agree, but they get me. They understand what I believe and why I believe it. You know, that I was hurt, you know, in a church or something. I was, and that's why I have a problem with this. And that that person understands that, or whatever their objection is. So we want to, first step is this, is to listen well before we give some sort of answer. Um, let me just hit a few uh, reasons why listening, and this is in your workbook, it's already there. Listening comes before answering, we just said that, that's what the verse in Proverbs says. 
Listening is a form of respect. So when 1 Peter says, do so with gentleness and respect, listening is a huge form of respect. When you, when you really listen to someone, and again, we don't just mean open your ears and hear what they say. We mean really understand what they're saying and why they're saying it. Listening is an act of love. And this gospel we bring is a, is a gospel of, of, of love. And so we better be demonstrating it or our life doesn't match what we're saying. Uh, listening is getting to know their story. So in, under the story, our story idea, when I say listening, it's not just, we're not just talking listening ideas. You know, when someone does share about a hurt, you know, like they had a bad church experience, or I'm going to teach you this uh, next week, how to get past their intellectual objections to figure out what's their heart objection. There's always a heart objection going on. There's something going on in their heart, but they present it as an intellectual thing. And, and, and when you start getting to the heart level, there can be more understanding. It's a softer discussion as opposed to two people arguing about ideas, okay? So, but that's you getting to know their story. Okay, you're getting to know them, not just their ideas. You're getting to know who they are. There's a person surrounding all these ideas they have. We aren't just walking around brains on a stick, you know, with a bunch of ideas in our head. We believe these things because of matters of the heart, and we're trying to get to the heart. Listening, and this, this relates to that last one, as you're getting to know their story, listening will put you in a better position to explain the gospel in a way that makes sense to them and their story. In a sense, what I'm saying to you is that you need to become a student of this person. And again, I don't want to make it sound too academic, but out of love, you want to get to know them at such a deep level that when you do begin to explain the gospel, you're explaining the gospel in a way that makes sense to them, that speaks their language. Um, that's, the fancy word for that is, is contextualizing it. You're, you're putting it into their context, and I'm going to talk about that in the next two weeks how to do that. So you're not giving them a canned gospel presentation, you're giving them a gospel presentation that speaks to their hurts, their heart, their stronghold. Okay? But, but in this beginning stage, or all throughout really, you're, you're, you're getting to know them. And it's like you're learning about them so that you can do that. You're kind of getting the, the, the data, I guess you could say, so that you can make that good presentation. Listening builds trust. Listening builds trust. That trust bridge builds. When they feel listened to, they trust you to divulge more, to share more of themselves to you. And finally, and here's the mirror effect again, this is huge. The more you listen to them, the more they will listen to you when you do share your story or God's story. If you're a good listener, they're going to tend to listen more to you. If, all you're, if they can tell that all you're there is you're just waiting long enough to get your words in, people back away from that. They don't really have time for that. Okay? Okay, so what I want you to do in the last couple of, uh, just I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do this. This is a little reflection here at the end, then I'm going to give you some homework as I send you on your way. Uh, you've got an exercise. A this is another reflection exercise um, on page 12. How well do I listen? Again, this is not scientific, but this will get your brain thinking along the sort of way. Try to be honest here. When you're answering these questions, pretend that you're actually in a discussion with someone that you don't agree with. This could be an argument between spouses. This could be, you know, your friend, your brother or sister, someone. I don't care if it's about politics, religion, or something dumb, like, you know, which way, whether the toilet paper roll should go one way or the other. Whatever it is. Um, you're disagreeing with someone. With that frame of mind, go through this and... And, and evaluate yourself and try to be honest, okay? So do that.
Okay, let's pull it back together. Um, you'll get a chance, you know, if you've got time in your groups, uh, uh, you'll get a chance to discuss how you did um, after we close off here. Um, and you can have, I'm going to give you a couple of things you can talk about in your groups after we close. That's one of them. How'd you do on this? Uh, what areas specifically did you notice that um, you could improve your listening on? Again, this doesn't cover everything. I think if we can get the deep sense of it, um, just to close our mouths. We've all heard that phrase, God gave us two ears and one mouth so that we would you know, listen twice as much as we talk, <laughs> as a reminder. And so listening is huge. I just can't stress that enough. Uh, what we're going to do coming up, we've, so we've, done, we've looked at this, and again, what that part dealt with is the, more the relationship building part, building that bridge of trust, okay, and getting past those outer passive defenses to now, here you are, assuming you are somebody, they see a difference in you, uh, they have a positive, you could substitute positive attitude to, they trust you. They're growing to trust you. They trust you and, they, and they see a difference in you. What happens is things start to slide into deeper and deeper conversations and you're going to start seeing more opportunities to actually get into gospel type spiritual conversations. This is where listening becomes huge. A lot of it shuts down right here because we come rushing in with all our stuff and they kind of do this and go, oh, no, I'm not bringing that up again because um, I got a sermon out of it. So, and so we got to really listen. But now let's say you're doing a good job of it and now you're starting to have ongoing conversations. That's what we're going to be looking at next week is what to do now when they start raising actual objections and they have actual problems with Christianity. We're going to talk about how to deal with that. Okay, so that comes up next. In the meantime, I want to give you some homework, uh, a couple of things to do. They're in your book. Again, some of this you could do in your groups after we close, but also you could do it with your partner that you picked last week. Be a great subject of conversation around coffee during the week. Uh, talk about those practical ways. We talked about practical ways to build a relationship to put legs to that. Tell your partner or tell your journey group Something like, uh, you know, I thought about that and I'm thinking of friend so-and-so and, -so and I, I need to just invite them to coffee. You know, I haven't done it in weeks or whatever, or I need to, whatever it is, fill in the blank, make it really specific, tell someone you're going to do it, and then get back to them and tell them you did it and how it went, okay? Try to commit yourself to actually taking an action on this, okay? Um, to actually do something that will increase that time with that friend or build that relationship. Discuss how you did on the listening ass assessment. And the third thing on there is something for you to do with your friend that, that doesn't, that's far from God is if you can, and again, don't force anything, but if you can get into a discussion with them, ask them some questions, do some listening. Uh, maybe they start talking about some topic. If it's a topic and you think, oh, I've got thoughts on this, resist the urge to tell and to correct and to give your point of view. Keep asking questions. Make your goal to just be to understand what they're saying and why they say it. Why do they believe it? Okay? Stop short of that. One of the things we need to learn is some patience. <laughs> and so be patient. God's, God, this is a process, remember? It's a, it's a process. So stay in the process. Okay? So that's something you can do. And we will pick it up next week and talk about the inner defenses. We'll see you then.